Welcome to this worshipful space. As we continue in worship, crank up your tablets, your phones, your TVs, your computers, crank that volume up, and, and let's continue to worship. Welcome to this space. We're glad you're worshiping with us. Let's worship.
sing Jesus. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever save me. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, and we live for you. Oh, yeah, we live for you. Sing holy, lift it up. It's holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder and show. Good morning, BFC. <laughs> hey, that's pretty good. Try one more time. Good morning, BFC. All right, all right. Weird times we're in today. Um, and even if you're not here, you're us. We are us. And so I just, um, <laughs> so before I kick the water bucket, um, just hope that you all will, will uh, feel a part of it and, and just worship God the way that we, we do. I have a few announcements for you here. Um, I've got a good one to start out with. Hope Christian Preschool and Daycare is going to open tomorrow. <laughs> Small but mighty group we are. Uh, the COVID-19 guidelines have been uh, received and uh, steps have been taken to, to meet them. And it's going to start tomorrow. Um, the Facebook page. They've got a great Facebook page. Um, I know I'm an old guy, and I don't know much about Facebook and computers, but it's a nice page. Trust me. Go in and take a look. Um, there is a new enrollment packet that needs to be completed before you, you begin, and that's available online. In the online, um, you can email or text to, are you ready? 
7686 and request the enrollment packet. Or the office number is, this is a phone number, 661-832-2267. I could have done that differently. I got people that call me and say, hey, I need some, hey, I need some information for you. My number is 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. We'll, we'll do this again. Okay. Office 661-832-2267. Um, email or text to 661-472-7686, and um, you get the new packet. It needs to be completed before you come, so because it, it covers all of the COVID-19 stuff, and and um, yeah, it's a lot of stuff. So anyway, um, and in going on this, make sure, if you would please, that your contact information for the church is accurate. Um, the office, you can email the office at office at BFC NAS, or the church office number is 661-832-2145. We need that information to be correct because that's one of the few ways we have to keep in touch with you. And we will be sending out a survey this coming week. Um, you may have noticed we're in, the, in a pastoral change. And part of that change, there's a, like a nine-step process we go through. We're in steps two and three, and that is asking the church people to, to give us a, members or not, this is a, if you're in the congregation, give us a, um, what, what you would like to see in, in the coming pastor. And then the board will take that, and they will work on that and, and try to, to meet the needs of, of any coming. Okay? I um, want to thank you for uh, staying faithful in your prayers and in your your offerings um, and and actually attendance in church in, in, in these times. And we do have two celebration donations. Um, Jim and Shelly. Hey. Um, yeah. There you go. Oh, I'm sorry. I shouldn't yell. Um, their 40th anniversary today. is today. <laughs> Happy anniversary. All right. And they gave 40 bucks. So let's hit. Okay. One more. Yay. Pretty good. Um, <laughs> Susan and Rob Wyckoff uh, donated $87 to celebrate Don Schroeder's 87th birthday. Right. So let's hear for that. Yay! <laughs> All right. The last thing I have for you is a solemn note and a happy note at the same time. The Pastors Parkers are moving on. They've been called elsewhere. And guys, we really have appreciated your time with us. Um, you guys are neat people. I walked into church one time and Pastor was, David was going like this. And I thought, he should know where the bathroom is by now. But then he turned around, he had Judah. He was rocking Judah. So he's a, they're good people. Uh, but this is their last Sunday here. Uh, I know, I know. Uh, but Pastor Hannah will be speaking in a little bit. Um, yeah. <laughs> 40 years of that, Jim. Good job, man. <laughs> so anyway, uh, um, <laughs> so we at four o'clock this afternoon, we are going to be saying goodbye to these guys. They will be here at the church out front and we're going to have um, a BFC drive by uh, to say, guys, thank you for your time here. And we wish you the best. We'll be praying for you in your new uh, calling, and we know you're going to do a great job there too. So anyway, four o'clock this afternoon. If you come, we're going to come in the south entranceway. Going to come along here. They'll be here. We can, you know, um, give them our cards, our thanks, and then we'll exit on out that way. So just so we don't have a traffic jam, let's just come up, come in this way, come out that way, and we'll we'll say so long to you then. Okay. So. Um, that's all I've got. Uh, keep your prayers, your offerings going. And, and when your offering is taken, you can do it the three ways. You can do it online. You can mail it to uh, 2801 Hughes Lane. The zip code is 93304. Or drop it in the door here. And they will be prayed over and they will be put to God's use. So thank you very much.
worship you. I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. Say that again. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you.
here. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. We're going to go to a time of prayer now, and um, there's one thing we can do together. Um, so I just ask you to bow your head, close your eyes, unless you're driving. Just wait. Don't do close your eyes while you're driving. But otherwise, let's just talk to God. And what a song to start off with. So, um, yeah, let's, let's, let's pray together. Father, uh, it is true. You are still working. Even though the world seems crazy, even though we don't really know what's going on or how we're going to go. One thing we do know is that, Father, you're in charge, and we can trust you, and we can put our lives and the lives of our loved ones in your hands, and we can be certain that you will work things out for the good of those who love you. You promised that. We hold you to that promise. And, Father, we've read the Psalms. We know that it's, it's okay to... Um, tell you we don't know what's going on we don't have um we don't know the way out but we do know the one who does know the way out and that's you father we give our lives we give our families we give it all to you and we just ask that you watch over us and guide us through this father thank you for some good years with the parkers um they were were they are great people, great pastors, and we just thank you for the time you loaned them to us. And now as they go off uh, to their new calling, we, uh, we give them back to you, and we just ask you to uh, continue to bless them, to continue to work in their ministry. It's so important to bring young kids, not kids, students, to, to you, and um, they do that, and we just... Uh, we just ask your blessings and continued presence and guidance to the pastors parkers and father again thank you for being you thank you for being the constant in our lives and thank you that you are the kind of god who is always with us always working for us and will will um when we come through this on the other side we get covid 19 out of the way we get the new pastors in we can look back and we can say there's one reason that this all worked out and it's you so father we just give it to you, and we just thank you. And now, can you join me, please, in saying the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, I'm pretty sure that this is the most awkward way to preach ever. There's like five people here. And I think, <laughs> I think I might prefer to preach to an empty sanctuary, but that's okay. I just have to make awkward eye contact with Shelly and Angie, Charles. That's fine. It'll be great. But really, though, I'm feeling all kinds of nostalgic today. Today is the three-year anniversary of our first Sunday in Bakersfield, so it feels very appropriate that it is our last Sunday in Bakersfield. Um, <laughs> Um, it feels like we just got here, but also that we've been here forever, but like in the good way, like not the bad way, like it's been terrible. No, it's been really, really great. Um, there's so many things I'm going to miss about BFC. I'm going to miss Shelly interrupting Brett's sermons. I'm going to miss blind jokes about Scott. I'm going to miss Shelly's obsession or Sarah's obsession with people wearing socks and sandals. I'm going to miss Aiden Holland saying, What? And I'm going to miss conversations with Cooper during greeting time. I'm going to miss so many things about BFC. Um, but mostly I'm really, really thankful. I'm really thankful that David and I had the opportunity 
to come and have our first ministry assignment in the most gracious place in the entire world, I think. And I've said that several times in the last few weeks, I know. But let me just tell you, on our interview weekend, David and I got to go to one of Landon's soccer games, and I asked Scott Kurtz what his son looked like at the soccer game, and he said nothing to me. He said nothing about the fact that he's blind, and I didn't even realize until we were on our way home on the airplane. And David said, Hannah, what were you thinking? And then I had to just like live with that for like four months before we got here. I like kept me up at night. I'm not even joking. I would lay there and be like, oh my word, how could they hire us when I would do something so awful on my interview weekend? Ugh. No, but that is grace, people. And I am so grateful that David and I had the opportunity to get to pastor here and experience that and take that with us when we go. So there's so many options for the way you can do your last sermon, and you can do it so long and say all the things that you want to say, or you can do it really short and concise and leave people with a really great taste in their mouth. So that's what I'm going to go with. And so if you want to open your Bibles to Exodus chapter 3, um, Exodus is the second book in the Bible, chapter 3, so very beginning. Um, and in the meantime, while you're finding that in your Bible, um, have you ever done something over and over and over and over again? And it's just the same thing over and over again. And then one day something's different about it. Like something clicks in you and, or, or about the situation and it just changes. It's special. It's different. Um, I think that's probably the best way to describe youth ministry. It's the same thing over and over. And it's the same conversations with kids over and over and over again until one day it's just not. One day it's different and something has clicked with you and with the students, and it just becomes special. You have just identical interactions over and over and over again until it clicks. Um, and I think the hard part is that, like, most of the time you wonder, like, if the kids are listening to you. You wonder if the kids even like you. Um, you wonder what is going on in their brain when they're half asleep when you're preaching a sermon. Um, but I had one of those moments with a student recently, and this student has not been our easiest student. They um, have been full of attitude and sass, and our first probably two years here were just me telling them, like, stop giving me attitude. Like, all of our one-on-one -on -one conversations were, stop giving me attitude. Like, pay attention to me. Stop doing what you're doing. Stop sassing people. Stop sassing me. And that was it. They were all attitude. And I was pretty sure that they hated every bone in my body. Um, they often wouldn't listen to what I was saying, and mostly they just made it really, really hard to love them. Um, because even though it's my job, sometimes loving students is hard. We all know that. <laughs> but then about two years into our ministry, something shifted. Um, both of us grew and matured, because one of the things that I have learned in my time here that is that even more important than maturing as a kid is maturing as an adult. And so I did some maturing, and our student did some maturing, and something just clicked and changed, and it became a lot easier to be their pastor and their friend. And we were hanging out recently, and they were kind of sharing some of the things that they were going through, some, some really, like, intense struggles that they were having. And, um, and I had a moment where, the, like, the same conversation over and over again changed. And the student looked at me and said, Pastor Hannah, I want my life to look different. I don't want to be involved in the stuff that the people around me are involved in. I want to date somebody that loves Jesus, because that's important to teenagers. And, and I want them to love Jesus with their whole heart. I don't want to live with the chaos in my life. I just want my life to be filled with Jesus. And that was the moment that I knew that I was walking on holy ground. The moment that I knew that the Spirit was meeting us and, and was meeting us right there where we were at. And it was a moment that I could have replicated over and over and over again in the last three years of my ministry. But, but when, she, when they started to talk, that's when it changed. And it was a moment that I can point to and say, God met us there in my car. That moment was sa sacred and holy and sanctified. And that leads us kind of into our passage this morning. So if you have your Bibles open to, to Exodus chapter 3, um, it's the story of the burning bush. And some of you know it, and some of you might, know, might not, so I'm going to read it, and then I'll paraphrase it. 
it says, starting in, chapter, in verse 1, um, Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, or Mount Sinai, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that through the bush was on, though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. Then the Lord saw that he had gone over to look. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. The story of Moses is interesting because Moses was born and raised in Egypt as a Hebrew man, but he was raised by Pharaoh's daughter. Moses ends up seeing the injustice in his, his people, in the Hebrew people's lives, um, being enslaved in Egypt, and he ends up killing an Egyptian slave master and has to flee Egypt and hide in the desert where he ultimately finds his wife and begins working for his father-in-law, Jethro. He was a shepherd and was taking his flock to the far side of the desert to graze, and this was something that he would have done probably many, if not hundreds of times before this. This time was different, though. This time he came across a bush, and it was on fire, but instead of, like, burning up, it just kept burning. Like, it didn't go away. And, um, and Moses goes over to check it out, because that's a pretty odd occurrence, and realizes that something is different about this bush. And that's when he hears a voice telling him to go back to Egypt and to free the Hebrew people, his people, Moses questions who's asking him and realizes that it's God who's calling him to do this. Now, pause for a second. Some of us, myself included, would love to hear the audible voice of God. And I think it would be awesome. It, it feels like if God spoke and I heard an actual voice, I would do literally whatever God said. Whatever. And I thought that's what Moses should do. But Moses doesn't end up doing that. Moses decides to handle things different. Moses decides to test God, which is never a good idea. I tested God by telling God that there are two places in the entire world I would never take a ministry assignment, California and Phoenix, Arizona. And we all know how that is working out for me. <laughs> no, but California has been great, so I have high hopes for Arizona. But moral of the story, don't test God. But Moses does. Moses tests God, and God over and over and over again provides an answer satisfactory to Moses. And so finally, Moses hits God with the big one. He says, and this is, in chapter, this is moving on into chapter 4, um, starting with verse 10. It says, Moses said to the Lord, pardon your servant, Lord. I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. And the Lord said to him, who gave human beings their mouths? Who makes them deaf or mute? Who gives them sight or makes them blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go, I will help you speak, and I will teach you what to say. Moses puts up a little bit more of a fight. He asks God for a couple signs. And so God ends up sending his brother with him to help him speak. And the story ultimately ends with Moses freeing the people out of Egypt. So what am I getting at? What could I possibly have to say on my last Sunday as a pastor at BSC? It's this. There's two moments in particular that are significant in the story of the burning bush in chapters 3 and 4. The first is the moment that Moses stumbles upon the bush. And God tells him to take his shoes off because he's walking on holy ground. This is an act of like humble submission on Moses' part. The ground itself is not holy. It was holy because it was the place that God and God's presence was meeting Moses. The ground that Moses had probably walked hundreds of times before was suddenly a place where he was intersecting with the presence of God, and it became holy. And it begs the question, what ordinary places in your life are you meeting with the presence of God? Are you finding yourself on holy ground often or not at all? And holy ground doesn't have to be in the church building. It can be in your living room or your kitchen or your car. It could be in your backyard. Holy ground can also be your BFC community, a place where you have been over and over again with people that you have known forever and ever. I think BFC is holy ground. 
I have watched the way that God has come and met us here, and there's evidence of it everywhere. Evidence in the way that I have watched peace and health settle over this place in the three years that we have been here. Evidence in the way that I have watched students come face to face with God and say, yes, I want more of that. I believe that God is going to continue to meet you as a church no matter who is attending, who the pastor is, and whether you are attending in person or online. Holy ground is most often found in the ordinary places of our life. Find those ordinary places places. The second moment in the story happens when Moses tells God he can't speak, and God says, who gave human beings their mouths? Who makes them deaf or mute? Who gives them sight or makes them blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go, I will help you speak, and I will teach you what to say. One of the harder parts of my job is helping people, and especially students, recognize that they can be called even if they're not a pastor. Because I think it's confusing when most of the time, the only time we hear that language is when pastors are saying, like, I'm, I'm called to do this, or I'm called to go somewhere, usually far away. And we don't hear that a lot in, from people that are teachers or construction workers or people who work at Walmart. You know, we don't hear that often. But I think each of us is called in our own context, in our own way. In the story of the burning bush, it may look as if Moses is being called to go to some faraway place in a land he's never been. But really, he's being called home to his people, to his neighbors. And even though the place makes him uneasy and uncomfortable, he's being called. There's another story in scripture in the New Testament in Mark chapter 6. And it's, it's a story that begins with Jesus on a boat. And Jesus is on a boat, and he docks in front of a large group of people. And they're gathered to hear him speak. And this, um, I'm going to read the scripture. It starts in uh, verse 34 of chapter 6 of Mark. And it says, When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. By this time, it was late in the day, so his disciples came to him. This is a remote place, they said, and it's already very late. Send the people away so that they can go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But he answered, you give them something to eat. They said to him, that would take more than half a year's wages. Are we, go- are we to go and spend that much on bread and give it to them to eat? How many loaves do you have, he asked. Go and see. When they found out, they said, five, five loaves and two fish. Then Jesus directed them to all to have all the people sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties. Taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to his disciples to distribute to the people. He also divided the two fish among them. They all ate and were satisfied, and the disciples picked up 12 baskets of broken pieces of bread and fish. The number of men who had eaten were 5,000. People start to get hungry, and Jesus' disciples are looking for options for them to eat, and they decide that they need to send the people away from Jesus to find their food. Instead, Jesus tells them, the disciples, to feed the people. The disciples are obviously perplexed because the whole reason that they're having this conversation is because there's no food. But they do some searching, and they come up with five loaves and two fish. All of this in an entire group of 5,000-plus people have to offer our five loaves and two fish. What horrible Nazarenes. In 5,000 people, five loaves and two fish. But they offer it up anyway, this measly gift, and they give it to Jesus, who then blesses it. By the end of the day, not only had the over 5,000 people eaten, but the disciples were able to fill up 12 baskets of leftovers. The beautiful part of these stories is that God does not work alone. It's evident in these passages that God doesn't work alone, but he rather works in relationship with us. He doesn't work singularly, but is always seeking to be co-creators with us. God doesn't look at Moses and say, yeah, I'm just going to go free the the Hebrew people by myself. God doesn't look at the 5,000 people and say, well, I'm going to make food magically appear for you. Rather, God 
is in relationship with us and works with us and enable, calls and then enables and empowers them to work with God, to do exactly the work that God is calling them to do. Because of this, I can confidently say to you, if you are willing, God is able. This applies both to you personally and also as a community, BFC. If you are willing, God is able. If you are willing to do the work that God has called you to do, both individually and as a community, God is more than able to see you through it, to give you the tools to do it, and to see it through to completion. Do you look around and say, well, all I have or all we have is five loaves and two fish, I guess not much is going to happen here. Or do you look at the five loaves and two fish and willingly and generously give those to God with full confidence that God is going to do great things in your life and here? Moses was called to fight an entire empire that was enslaving an entire people group. What are you being called to? Maybe you're being called to buy your high-risk neighbor's groceries to help in the food pantry, to drive someone on errands, or to visit people who can't get out much. Maybe you're being called to help free people bound by the change of systemic racism, divisive politics, idol worship. Maybe you're called to set aside your differences with the people around you for the good of really, really loving your neighbor. Maybe you feel inadequate to call out the wrong that you see in the world. But if you are willing, God is able. If you are willing to do the hard work that God is calling you to, God is going to provide you with everything that you need to get that work done. It's hard to know what to say on your last Sunday, knowing that I will probably never have the opportunity to speak like this in front of you all again. And there's so much that I wish I could fit into a tiny little sermon. Um, I want to tell you that God loves you individually. God loves you. And I want you to know that God is good and merciful and love. But the good news is, is that I think most of you guys already know that. So I decided that what I wanted to remind you of is that the monotony of your life can be holy ground. The monotony of what little or much you have can bring about holy ground. This 100 plus year old church can be holy ground and has been many many times for me, often in this exact place, because God has met me here. I also want to remind you that God is calling you to big things, BFC, and if you are willing to do those big, hard things, God is able and will see you through to its completion. Let the holy ground that you meet God on be the jumping off point for the great things that God is calling you to. And so, as I close... Bakersfield First Church, my first ministry assignment. Community that I love, may the Spirit of God meet you in the monotony of your daily life and make it holy ground. And may that holy ground be the launching pad for the good work that the Lord is going to and has already called you to. We love you and there's nothing you can do about it.